What I'm going to try and focus on today really is um, thinking about antivenoms from the perspective of a drug target and try and convey to those of you in the audience who are perhaps less familiar with, with snake bite the complexity of venoms and the challenges this brings um, from a therapeutic point of view, whether we're using antibodies or other, other modes of treatment. So you've seen this slide from Abdul that kind of encapsulates um, the scale, the burden of disease of snake bite. But I think it's worth just highlighting again. Um, I particularly like this photo on the right-hand side because I think this sums up the threat of snake bite in a, in a really visual way. You have uh, rural agricultural workers who are at uh, risk from a snake bite basically 24 hours a day, whether they're working in their job as shown here or whether they're in their villages at night. Um, and as Abdul mentioned, it's, uh, snake bite is a neglected tropical disease that is disproportionately affecting those rural people in the tropical and subtropical parts of the world. So we've not really talked much about the, the actual cause of this, and that's the snake. So uh, there are many different species of venomous snakes, but almost all of them that are medically important to people have what we call a front fang venom system. So on either side of their upper jaw, they have a venom producing gland, which produces a cocktail of different toxins, uh, usually proteins or peptides, um, which are um, expelled from the venom gland following uh, a contraction of the muscle at the back of the gland. And they go into these kind of hollow tip fangs, you can see here. And this system is a really fantastic way for the snakes to inject a large bolus of toxins very, very quickly. So you can see from this is a, a gaboon viper and this kind of massive uh, amount of yellow liquid here. This is the venom. So these snakes have, a, have these wonderful adaptations that allow them to expel these biochemical mixtures very, very quickly. There are two main groups of medically important snakes that we are worried about when we're talking about snake bite. There's a lapids and there's vipers. So in terms of the lapids, we've got things like cobras, mambas, coral snakes and crates and vipers. We've got a whole host of species like rattlesnakes and puff adders and saw scale vipers that you heard from, from Abdul. So there's diversity there in terms of the species. All of these snakes have these front fang venom systems that allow them to inject lots of venom very, very quickly. And that is predominantly the reason why these snakes are medically important to people and other snakes are not. So the venoms themselves are these, these cocktails, if you like, of mixtures of proteins and peptides predominantly, as well as some organic components. But really the key thing that I want to explain to you today is the fact that these venoms vary. They really can vary extensively, both intraspecifically and intraspecifically. So as you go from one snake species to the next, you're going to have variation in terms of the toxins. Even intraspecifically, different populations of those snakes, you can have different molecules that are causing pathology that you have to try and neutralize. This obviously causes a major problem when we're talking about therapeutic design for snake bite. We've got multiple toxins in multiple species. There are multiple layers of complexity. So the snakes have evolved venom systems ultimately to catch prey. So their primary, primary function for the venom is to immobilize prey. And we think that that complexity, the variation of venom composition, has evolved because different snakes are feeding on different prey. And over evolutionary timescales, those molecules are going to vary quite extensively. But clearly, snakes will also use their venom for defense. And that's the context by which people are bitten. Snakes aren't trying to eat us. They're defending themselves from a perceived threat. So Abdul showed this slide in his talk, and I think it really quite nicely simplifies um, snake venom variation. So here you've got about 10 different toxin types indicated by acronyms that you don't need to know. And you can see that some of these toxin types are more abundant in vipers on the top, some are more abundant in elapids on the bottom, some are found in both, for example, some are associated with causing uh, hematoxic effects, some are associated with causing neurotoxic effects, some are associated with causing cytotoxic effects. And these vary in abundance between different species. But there is another layer of complexity to that, because within each of those different toxin families, there are multiple isoforms of toxins that are related to one another, share structural similarities, but have a lot of variation, particularly in surface-exposed regions. 
So you can quickly see that when you have variations at a toxin family level, you have variations from one group of snakes to another, and you have variations within toxin families, you have this real melting pot of different drug targets that potentially you might need to neutralize. And it's very difficult actually to figure out which toxins are really important for causing pathology in people, and which toxins are really the priority in species A or species B or species C to try and neutralize. Now, Abdul also spoke a bit about the pathology that presents. Clearly, venom composition is going to dictate pathology that's caused. The functional activity of the toxins present in a venom are going to dictate what you see in a snake bite victim. So on the, on the lapid side of things, we tend to find these snakes have neurotoxins. They primarily will act at the neuromuscular junction. You can see there are multiple places they can act at the neuromuscular junction and different isoforms in this case of a toxin family called three-finger toxins can act at different sites to perturb that neurotransmission at the neuromuscular junction. And the output of those toxins is ultimately neuromuscular paralysis, so potentially lethal effect. And some snakes might have, I don't know, one, two, or three of these working on different sites. Some snakes might have all of them. Some snakes might have one or perhaps none. But you can see how this variation can work together in an additive or potentially synergistic effect to cause a really uh, strong pathological impact. And the same is true with the vipers that predominantly cause hemotoxicity. In the venom of any one snake, you might have toxins that are promoting hemorrhage, other toxins that are promoting reductions in blood pressure, other toxins that are acting on different steps of the blood clotting cascade. And collectively, all of these different toxins are going to come together to cause quite a pronounced effect. And usually this is characterized by systemic hemorrhage, often coupled with the non-clotting blood syndrome, um, which Professor Habib mentioned earlier. So at the moment, to combat these diverse effects from diverse snakes, we use polyclonal antibodies. As we've talked about already, these are uh, generated in a, in a in a way that principally has remained unchanged for over 100 years. So we're immunizing animals, isolating their antibodies, and then formulating them for ultimately intravenous injection in a clinical environment. And I think Abdul's really done a great job of explaining to you some of the limitations with those therapeutics, particularly from a safety perspective, an affordability perspective, an accessibility perspective. And I'm really going to focus for the rest of the talk and just talking about it from uh, a um, across snake species limitation perspective. So where are our inefficacies and how we go about making generic treatments for snake bite? So hopefully you understand from this intro, venom variation is obviously gonna undermine the efficacy of these products to different snake species. So if I make an anti-venom against a cobra and try and treat someone who's been bitten by a rattlesnake, that product is not gonna work. The antibodies are not gonna recognize the rattlesnake toxins, they're not gonna neutralize those toxins. So. Typically what happens is a manufacturer will make a polyvalent antivenom. They will take multiple venoms, they will immunize that animal with a mixture of different venoms, and you get obviously a collective response, lots of different antibodies against all of those different toxins in those different venoms. But you do get a dilutory effect, of course, because you're only bitten by one snake species. So that gives you a huge amount of redundancy in your antivenom that is effectively not going to help treat that patient and is just going to increase the risk of an adverse reaction. It also means you have to give higher doses of therapeutics to, to protect that individual, and that increases the cost. And again, as Abdul kindly pointed out earlier on, some of these antivenoms are really expensive. So the more vials you have to give to save a life, for someone who is living in these disadvantaged populations of the tropics, they might not be able to afford one vial of antivenom, let alone 10. So you've seen this slide too, and, and this really emphasizes the reason we have so many different manufacturers of antivenoms is because of venom variation. If we just had, if snake bite was one entity with 10 toxins across all snakes, then we wouldn't have this issue. But because of venom variation, manufacturers have to try and produce therapeutics that are going to be effective for their specific region. So there are lots of manufacturers making regional products either on a country level or a subcontinental level, or in a few cases on a continental level to cover all of the medically important snakes in that region. And this leads to obviously a fragmented market for manufacturers, and it's not a particular profitable market for them either. This means we're really vulnerable to a few key manufacturers actually stopping producing their antivenoms. And this is something that has happened particularly 
in the African context over the past two decades, with European-based manufacturers withdrawing from the market because of concerns about profitability and sustainability. And the consequences of that have been really quite severe. Um, we've seen an influx of fake products to the market, dilute products, geographically inappropriate products as well. So for example, we've seen cases where antivenoms made in, uh, against Indian snakes have been imported into Africa for use for treating snake bite there because there is no specific therapy available. Um, and that has caused problems, and I hope it's already apparent why, because of venom variation. Indian antivenoms are gonna be specific to those toxins, not to African toxins. Um, and this has led to case fatality rates going from you know, below 2% to 10 to 12% in some countries in Africa with the inappropriate use of these, these therapeutics. So there are issues here around the regulation, the regulatory frameworks that govern antivenoms. Um, they're very weak. We have issues in terms of being able to explain to people which products are appropriate to use in different regions of the world. And this is also limited by uh, extremely limited clinical trial data as well. So uh, Abdul mentioned some of the challenges with doing snake bite clinical trials, and it is particularly challenging if you think about having multiple biting species in any particular region, a lack of diagnostic tools, variable outcomes, different pathologies in different people bitten by different snakes. Um, and here you can see a map that kind of summarizes the, the amount of clinical trials that have been performed um, over the years in, in different parts of the world. So the size of the pie charts is the number of participants scaled here, and each pie represents, slice of pie represents a different uh, study. And you know, you can draw attention here. If we, if we took Abdul's group out of this room, we would have no clinical trial data from Africa at all. So there are real issues in terms of um, robust clinical data on the efficacy of different products or comparisons of different products against different biting species. So a lot of the uh, reasons by which antivenoms are, are registered and licensed for use in countries comes based on historical use of serotherapies plus um, animal model preclinical testing. Um, there are challenges here as well in that animal models are not particularly accurately reflecting a snake bite scenario but they do at least tell us whether the antibodies in our products are capable of neutralizing different pathologies caused by uh, different snake venoms. So and if you look at the table on the right-hand side here, again, you know, don't need to know the detail here, but here we've got a list of different medically important snakes found in Africa. And here across the top, we've got a variety of different antivenoms uh, that are made against either multiple snake species or specific snake species. And each kind of shaded box tells you the amount of times that those products have been tested. And this is in a preclinical model, not a clinical model. And what you'll note here is there's huge gaps where we simply do not know whether any of these antivenoms are effective. And in fact, there's, there's actually some products that there is no publicly available preclinical data on their efficacy against any of these biting snakes as well. So there's huge gaps here uh, that undermine our confidence in antivenom use and antivenom efficacy as well. And you can imagine for a regulator or for a clinician, it's very difficult to predict which antivenoms might be effective and which ones might not be. So here's an example of a study we did to try and explore this. And we were interested in um, understanding which antivenoms available in Africa might be effective for uh, treating snake bite in East Africa. Um, and we used uh, mostly uh, products that were available in Kenya for this study. So we tested the ability of six different antivenoms, five that were polyvalent, so directed against multiple snake species, and one that was a species-specific antivenom at neutralizing different snake venoms. So we had six snake venoms in total. These are the most medically important snakes found in East Africa. We have three cobra species here, Puffada, a source scale viper, and the black mamba. And we did a range of in vitro testing investigating the binding properties of these antivenoms against the different venom proteins and, and also their, their in vitro neutralization capabilities. But at the end of that process, we performed a preclinical study in an animal model to understand whether these products could protect against uh, the lethal effects of these different, very different venoms. And so the outcome of that is that it's very variable. Um, so no one antivenom was highly effective against all six of those snake species. Um, no one antivenom was poor against all six. Some were better against some species, some were better against others. Some were low level, some were higher level. 
And you can see here, just from the list next to the images, which ones turned out to be the most uh, uh, effective in that animal model. But the point I guess I'm making here is that there's a huge amount of variability. And most patients are not going to know which snake they've been bitten by. A clinician isn't going to know which snake someone's been bitten by. And it's very difficult for a clinician then to make an informed choice as to which therapeutic is going to be right for that patient. But the reality is, in somewhere like Africa, there's probably only one antivenom available in that clinic for that patient anyway. There might not be any at all. So often the decision making is taken away from those people. And you, know, you either get lucky or you don't, right? You're, if you get bitten by a snake, you might be lucky and there might be a, an appropriate product available for you that you can use to, to be treated. But you might be unlucky and actually there might not be an available antivenom that's specific to that snake that's bitten you. So there's huge gaps in terms of coverage. One thing that we've seen a lot of as well is um, variability in terms of antibody content in these products, and that's certainly influencing the efficacy of them. And it will also influence the, the, the dose that needs to be given to a, a snake bite victim. Uh, Abdul can probably speak better to this than, than myself being a clinician, but I think it's also very difficult for many snake bite clinicians to actually know what an appropriate dose of an antivenom is depending on what snake has bitten someone, how much venom might have been injected, how severe the symptoms might be. And that's further confused by really large variability in terms of the amount of antibodies that can be present in a vial of a specific product. So again, here there's issues with regulation. There are no minimum specifications for an antibody content, for example, for an antivenom. Obviously, um, the immunogen composition, the antigens used, are clearly going to also influence the dose efficacy of a product, partly because of venom variation. But also, we know that, for example, the neurotoxins found in elapid venoms are typically lower molecular weight components. They're not as immunogenic as the higher molecular weight toxins found in viper venoms. And so if a, if a, a manufacturer is simply going to mix these venoms together and inject them into an animal, then there's clearly the potential there for you to have a skewed immune response, um, which may be undesirable. And, and certainly from preclinical testing, we know that the, we have weaker dose efficacies for antivenoms against the lapid snakes than we do against viperid snakes. But there are lots of other completely fundamental questions when we're talking about polyvalent antivenoms. And one question is, well, how many different venom immunogens do we need? What are the right venom immunogens to actually used to stimulate responses that are going to give us neutralizing antibodies against a breadth of species. And there's been surprisingly little work done on this topic. It's quite difficult to identify which toxins are really key to neutralize uh, and which ones perhaps are of less importance. So keep in mind, the snakes are using these toxins to catch prey, not to kill people. So there's a lot of redundancy in there where there might be toxins that simply have no effect on us compared to some that do. So one piece of work that we did was just to explore this. We were looking at hematoxic snake venoms, um, and we wanted to understand whether we could expand the geographical utility of an, of an experimental antivenom um, by selecting representative venoms from different geographies rather than focusing on a specific, specific geographical region. And we essentially made two different experimental antivenoms in sheep, one consisting of seven venoms as the immunogen, one consisting of 12, the same seven, but an additional five, and trying to understand whether expanding that immunogen pool actually has a, a beneficial or a detrimental effect to the resulting antivenom. So from an in vitro binding perspective, when we compared the, um, the profiles of the resulting polyclonal antibodies against each of those different venoms and the venom mixtures, essentially the profiles were really similar, and we, we saw comparable binding to venoms that weren't included in an immunizing mixture um, for the, the experimental antivenom that only had seven venoms. And so that kind of suggests that once you reach a certain amount of toxin diversity, adding additional venoms may not give you any particular additional breadth or benefit of toxin diversity. And then we did some potency studies again using an animal model. So this is a, a mouse model where we dose the mice with um, lethal doses of venom and we um, we're also treating them with antivenom at the same time and measuring the protection that those antibodies give. And here again, we see that by and large, the antivenom that has the fewer immunogens used um, gives you at least equivalent or in some cases superior potency compared to an antivenom where you use more and more and more immunogens. 
But there are exceptions, such as this one down here, where we see the opposites. This was a venom that was only included in the immunizing mixture for antivenom 2. And here we saw a, a big drop in terms of survival with the antivenom that didn't include that venom in the mixture. So this suggests that there probably are some very key toxins that you have to cover. And if we don't know anything about venom composition, which is how current antivenoms are made, we just take venoms and we inject them into animals, we don't care what the toxins are, then it's very difficult to actually be rational about designing antibodies to target specific toxins. So knowledge of venom composition is really crucial. And we certainly know that if you don't have insufficient breadth of immunogens, as in you don't have the diversity of toxins as your antigens, this is going to lead to inefficacies. And some really nice examples recently from work done in India. So in India, we have the biggest snake bite burden in the world. So there's probably about 58,000 deaths every single year. And this is predominantly caused by four um, biting species of snakes, or the big four, as they're called. This is the cobra, the crate, the carpet viper, and the Russell's viper. And you can see there's three of them are here on this, these nice images. So we've got the cobra here, here's the crate, and here's the, the carpet viper. Um, and all of the antivenoms available in India are made using venoms from those four species of snake. There's a number of different products, but they all use the same venom. And those venoms are all sourced from one region of the country. So from the southeast part of India, they get the venoms and they make the polyclonal antivenoms. This image is also highlighting a number of different species that are related to the big four, but are not the same. So we have here things like related cobras to the, to the spectacle cobra. We have related crates to the common crate, and we have a related sore scale viper as well. These venoms are not included in the immunizing mixture. So given what we know about venom variation, we know that there are differences. Here's our cobra in our immunizing mixture. Here's two other populations of the other cobra, and the same here for the crate. So we might predict, actually, the antivenoms that are made in India might not be covering all of the species that they need to in the region. And indeed, that's the case. So here again, you're looking at preclinical data, protection against lethal effects of venom. And what we see is, particularly for the monocle cobra found in the north of India, the antivenom is, is very, very weakly uh, in terms of its dose efficacy against one population and against the other population. It simply doesn't protect against the lethal toxins found in that venom. And there's other drops in efficacy elsewhere here too. So we have multiple antivenoms available for a country with the biggest snake bite burden in the world but we have a lot of venomous snake species that probably that anti those antivenoms are not going to work very well for at all. We talked also about intraspecific variation, and I guess this is the, the, the key take home here, is that that layer of complexity of vari venom variation uh, extends all the way down to population level. So here is a study with the, the spectacle cobra here. This is one of our big four biting species. It's found throughout India probably kills about 20 to 25,000 people a year. And when you look at its venom composition across different regions of the country, you'll see that different toxins will, will vary in terms of their abundance or presence or absence. The antivenom, which uses this venom as an immunogen, uh, it uses venom from the southeastern population. And you can see here that this antivenom works very well. So this dotted line is representing the minimum specification for the potency of the antivenom. And this, uh, this venom that's used to make the antivenom, the antivenom works very well against. But you can see there's drops in potency below the minimum spec in the north, in the east, and in the central regions of the country. So higher doses of antivenom would have to be given. And perhaps most importantly, against the western populations from Rajasthan, up here in the northwest of the country, the antivenom, again, did not work at all. So this is the same species that's used in the immunizing mixture, and yet we have an antivenom that's not working at all uh, to protect from the lethal effects. So bottom line, in India, where you have this huge burden of, of snake bite, you have the venom source down here, you have antivenoms that work well through the central and southern regions of the country, but then as you go north, you start, start to see drops in efficacy against the cobras, and in the far northwest, you see drops in efficacy against most of the species whose venom is used in the immunizing mixture. And for some, it just doesn't work at all. 
So hopefully, you've, the take home from this is venom variation causes a real problem. It's a massive headache. Snake bites this one thing, you get bitten by a snake, but there's so, many, so much complexity be beneath that from a snake species point of view, but also a toxin variation point of view between species, between different populations. And it makes it very difficult for us to understand which uh, toxins we need to neutralize and how we're best going about doing that and ensuring that we're going to have a product that retains that dose efficacy you want for a sufficient geographical area that it makes it a viable therapeutic. Now, obviously, there are lots of approaches that are being employed at the moment outside of the polyclonal antibody space to explore improving snake bite therapies, and you'll hear about some of those later on in this session. And I think some of the questions that we have is, well, how are, how are those therapeutics going to fit into existing ways we treat snake bites? Are we going to fortify existing antivenoms or or are there going to be companion treatments or are they going to be pre-dosing treatments or replacement treatments? And I think there's a lot of um, questions that really remain about what snake bite treatment is going to look like in the future. This is a, an image that Andreas, is, Andreas and team kindly produced for a review we were involved in. And I think it really encapsulates both the challenge, which I showed you before, this kind of isoformic and toxin family variation among snakes, and that we may need um, combination therapeutics ultimately to give us the, the geographical focus that we want for our, our treatments for snake bite moving forward. And that obviously brings with it a number of other challenges, particularly relating to the regulatory space. And so with that, I'll finish just to thank a lot of people who've been involved in the research I presented today, particularly at my institute, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and also collaborators elsewhere, our funders, and of course, all of you for coming to hear about snake bite at this conference. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Any one or two uh, key questions for Nick? Yeah. Thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, it's maybe a naive question, uh, so do we make a mistake when uh, taking, uh, for example, Malaysian Viper from Leiden uh, as a source of uh, our uh, uh, immunogen uh, rather than uh, Malaysian uh, Viper from Malaysia? It's a great question. So, I mean, I guess the thing to keep in mind with everything I've shown you is that I'm, I'm, I'm always giving you the extremes. So, we talked about population variation. There's a rattlesnake in the US, you can go 200 miles away, you know, you, you're paralyzed by its bites, it's neurotoxic, and at the other end, you get blisters and bleeding problems. That's the most extreme example of venom variation, the same species of snake. The Indian cobra I showed you here, there's, there's more subtle variation across its geographic range, and that clearly does have an impact on anti-venom efficacy. But there are lots of snake species where we don't see intraspecific venom variation, and you actually get very similar venom profiles across the geographical range. So it's a biological system for which, as always, everything is variable and there are extremes at different ends of it. So, but to answer your direct question, Malaysian pit vipers are known to have populational variation across their geographical range that varies with diet. So yeah, there yeah, is potential so if there. If it with uh, mice from a zoo or uh, from a lab, uh, maybe it has different... Uh... So you're specifically talking about generational thing, yeah. Yeah, so I think in that case, no, there are, there are no issues. So you wouldn't expect uh, a venom to change dramatically in an animal that's captive compared to in the wild, yeah. It would take many, many generations, evolutionary timescales to change, yeah. But I think if I may also comment on, on that question, it also depends on what the purpose is. If I remember correctly, you guys wanted to find monoclonal antibodies. And I think a lot of what you're talking about are polyclonal antivenoms where the titers really matter. In your case, the titer might not matter if you can just isolate that clone. Because as I, mean, I think an important point is, e even though there's a lot of venom variation, the same toxins are often present. Sometimes it's just the composition is completely skewed. So I think it really depends on what are you looking for titer and to use anti-serum directly, or do you want to just generate a big repertoire and isolate your clones and produce them other in another way? And yeah, I mean, absolutely. And all of this boils down to which are the really important toxins, right? So you might get variation in, in venom composition across a range, but there might not be variation in the three toxins that are really crucial for causing severe pathology in a person. So it, it, 
again, it's all, it depends, right? For every species, it depends. And we need, so we need knowledge of venom composition. We need to understand the breadth of those targets. We need to understand how they differ from one population or species to the next. But we also need that context of how important actually is that toxin for human pathology. Because if we don't have that, then how do we go about making really specific uh, therapeutics? friend Freak uh, was uh, on a television uh, well a few weeks ago and he was very excited about catching one snake that eats uh, other snakes probably you know it by name uh, and this one uh, supposedly is uh, resistant to uh, uh, snake bites uh, from a uh, regional snake uh, could we learn something from uh, this uh, species yeah I mean it's a good we get asked this question quite a lot um, there are lots of examples of, of other animals being resistant to snake venom toxins Usually it tends to be changes in molecular changes in their receptors that the toxins are targeting, which is obviously a bit difficult to use directly as a therapeutic. And often it tends to be high molecular weight serum based proteins that basically are just sticky and they can mop up some of these toxins. So, but you know, there is research in this space where people are looking particularly at derived peptides from some of those binding proteins to see whether they can be used as, as inhibitory, inhibitory molecules for snake bite. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. I think we can move Thanks. to the next speaker, uh, Professor. Uh,